And so we have learned that movement of sodium into the cell causes depolarization and movement of potassium out of the cell causes hyperpolarization. And these are different types of local potentials. What about the action of chloride? In most cases, chloride is moving into the cell and when chloride moves into the cell, it is also going to make the cell membrane more negative, or in other words, it's going to hyperpolarize it. But let's go a little bit into details of what happens with chloride. For a cell with a resting membrane potential of minus 70 millivolt, there are three possibilities for chloride. If we put it on a scale, chloride, ninth potential, can be equal to minus 70, which is exactly the resting membrane potential. It can be at a level more negative than the resting membrane potential, or it can be at a level which is less negative than the resting membrane potential. Under these conditions, if channels for chloride open, what is going to happen when the nice potential is equal to minus 70? The resting membrane potential being negative on the inside will be pushing chloride outward and the chloride concentration difference the chemical force will be pushing chloride inward. Each of them will have a force of 70, and so they are going to cancel the effects of each other, which means if extra channels for chloride open, nothing is going to happen. Chloride is not going to move at all. There will be no net movement. But in what will happen if in, in, in another condition, if, if in the same cell, the Nernst potential of chloride is minus 75. What will happen? Exactly the same electrical potential will be pushing chloride outward with 70 millivolt force. This time, the concentration force is going to be 75 and it will be again pushing chloride into the cell. In this case, the net driving force for chloride will be inward and fluoride will come into the cell bringing negative charges together with it and in the end the cell membrane will hyperpolarize. This is the condition that happens in many of the cells and during the formation of a local potential if chloride channels open the result is going to be hyperpolarization of the cell. The last possibility is here. The last possibility is that the electrical force, which is the resting membrane potential, is again forcing chloride outward with the force of 70, but this time concentration force is pushing chloride into the cell with a force of 65. The net force is going to be outward which means chloride will be moving out of the cell, bringing negative charges away from the cell, and this is going to make the cell less negative or more positive. And it is, in this case, the movement of chloride is going to depolarize the cell. So which of these are present in the body? Uh, when we are talking about the local potentials, if a chloride channel opens, we most of the time observe hyperpolarization. It has been discovered that in some immature nerve cells, this depolarization effect is present. But these immature cells are not normal. So in the normal condition, in the mature cells, this 
hyperpolarization action of chloride is going to take place. So if we summarize the effects of ions on uh, the membrane potential, if extra channels like ligand-gated, mechanically-gated sodium channels open for the sodium ion, the sodium is going to move into the cell and depolarize the cell. If ligand-gated channels or ligand-gated for potassium or ligand-gated channels for chloride open, then potassium is going to move out of the cell, hyperpolarizing it, or chloride will move into the cell, again, hyperpolarizing it. And the next question that we may ask is, where do local potentials form and how do we use them? One type of local potential can form in your sensory organs, like the case of something touching your skin. In that case, the sensory nerve terminals are going to convert the information of touch into a local potential. This local potential has a special name. It's called a sensory receptor potential or sensory potential. Another type of uh, local potential takes place between two neurons where they meet at a synapse. Um, in the second cell, which is called the postsynaptic cell that receives the information, a local potential is formed. And then this local potential has a special name and it is named the postsynaptic potential. Uh, so these are the places where you use the, where the nervous system uses the local potentials. But what are the properties of local potentials that differentiate them from our next subject, which is the action potential? This figure is going to help us uh, understand the first uh, property of it that differentiates it from the, an action potential. So uh, the local potentials are produced by mechanically or ligand-gated ion channels. Here is an example for the production of a local potential by a mechanically-gated ion channel. In the nerve terminal here, you have an ion channel which is mechanically-gated. When this channel is stretched to the sides by some stimulus, the channel is going to open and then ions, for example sodium, is going to move through this channel and it is going to produce a depolarizing type of local potential. This is an example of how mechanically, a mechanically gated channel can produce um, a local potential. Another example here is the production of postsynaptic potentials at a synapse. This, the, cell, the first cell here is our presynaptic cell before the synapse, and the second cell is the postsynaptic cell. So here is a bigger figure showing the relationship. The presynaptic cell has a neurotransmitter, which is a chemical substance. This neurotransmitter is going to be released from the presynaptic cell, and it comes and binds to the postsynaptic cell. When it binds the postsynaptic cell, what is going to happen? Then the ion channel is going to open, open and some ions, let's say sodium, is going to come in through the ligand-gated sodium channel and it is going to depolarize the cell. So these are examples of how a local potential can be formed by mechanically or ligand-gated channels. But how are action potentials formed? As we are going to see in another video, action potentials are formed by voltage-gated channels. This is the first difference between them. So the second difference between them is that the local potentials can be graded. Whereas action potentials are in all or none form. We are going to explain all or none action potential in another video, but let us explain how local potentials can be graded. What was the stimulus for the mechanically gated channel? It was being stretched from the sides. So 
in this example, the stimulus is a stretch or it's an input. Uh, in the second example, for the opening uh, of the ligand gated channel, what was the stimulus? A neurotransmitter was being released. So the amount of stretch in the first example and the number of neurotransmitters released in the second example is going to be the level of stimulus for us. So when the stimulus strength increases in case of local potentials, when the stimulus strength increases, the local potential amplitude is also going to increase. If we can think of this in, um, in a recording, then with a small stimulus, you have a small receptor potential depolarization. With bigger and bigger stimuli, you are going to obtain bigger receptor potentials. This is the example for the depolarization type local potentials. For hyperpolarizing local potentials, as you increase the size of the stimulus or the strength of the stimulus, the amplitude of hyperpolarization is going to increase. As you see here, there can be different amplitudes of local potentials. Therefore, we say that they can be graded according to the stimulus strength. But as we are going to talk about uh, it, uh, it in another video, action potentials are always going to be of the same size in a special cell. This is called or or none property of the action potential. Another difference between action potential and local potentials is the, the distance along which they can travel. Local potentials are only able to move very short distances, like a few millimeters. On the other hand, Action potentials are able to move long distances, which is, for example, can be up to one meter compared to one millimeter in the case of the local potential. Why is it so? Let's imagine that a local potential is formed along the extension of a nerve, like the dendrit or an axon or along a skeletal muscle fiber. Say, let's imagine that the local potential is formed at this point and it's, going, it's moving from my left to right. As it moves along this, it, get, in, in, it, it gets smaller and smaller in amplitude and in the end, it becomes zero. So this amount that it can travel is only one millimeter. On the other hand, it, imagine an action potential moving along a nerve fiber or a muscle fiber. An action potential is formed and it can move very long distances. It actually, it is not, it, the, the, the trick here is that it is not exactly this action potential forming and moving. As this action potential fades away, Next to it, another action potential is formed, and is, as, as, as the second action potential is fading away, another action potential is formed next to it. This way, action potential is able to move a long distance because it is repeating itself. So, the basic differences that we talked about uh, between local potential and action potential is one, local potentials are formed by mechanically or ligand-gated channels, whereas action potentials are formed by voltage-gated channels. Second property is local potentials can be graded depending on the strength of stimulus or the amount of neurotransmitter released. But action potentials that form in a certain excitable cell are always of the same amplitude, and this is called all, non all or non-low. The third difference is that 
local potentials fade away as they move along a nerve or a muscle fiber, whereas action potentials repeat themselves one after the other, and so they can move very long distances compared to the local potentials. These are all I would like to talk about. Thank you for listening.